This is live from Lincoln Center, and we're at the intermission of this production of William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night at the Vivian Beaumont Theater. And now let's join our host, Beverly Sills. The odd thing about Shakespeare is that no matter how funny or quirky the play, everyone tends to get very serious about the playwright. When school kids complain that Shakespeare is hard to understand, I often wonder how many of them are really referring to the emphasis placed on the symbolism or the double word play embedded in the fourth line of the first soliloquy. Well, tonight we're making our own small effort to reverse this sad trend. Recently, live from Lincoln Center's producer John Goberman had a chance to sit down and talk with director Nicholas Heitner. You're about to experience the rare pleasure of hearing a director talk about a smart, funny, and completely understandable play in a manner that is smart, funny, and completely understandable. This production is as clear as anything I've ever seen of Shakespeare. The, the language and the, the structure is such that you don't miss a word. What did you do to get that? Well, we spent a great deal of time in rehearsal exploring other plays by Shakespeare, other pieces of Shakespeare, so that I could identify to those members of the cast who hadn't done that much of it before certain patterns, certain tricks. Like what? Well, you talk about clarity, and to me, clarity is absolutely top of the agenda. Uh, it doesn't matter how emotionally true you are if you're indecipherable. Uh, there is also, it seems to me, throughout Shakespeare, a balance that must be achieved between passion and control. Mm -hmm. That seems to be at the center, not just of the acting style, but um, uh, of his view of the world. And at the very heart of Hamlet's advice to the players, in the, which is traditionally, and I think rightly, thought to be Shakespeare's thoughts about acting, uh, is the idea that not too much one way, not too much the other way. Uh, and Frankly, isn't that the secret of life, that, it, that it, balance? It is indeed the secret of life, but I'm not sure it's the secret of a lot of contemporary acting. That what you're dealing with here is a playwright who creates people who are always articulate, always eloquent, whose minds and feelings are finer than ours. Now, if you allow your passions to run away with you, uh, very often the language will become incomprehensible because if you are emotional to the point that um, your articulacy disappears, if you're you got it wrong. speechless. Yeah, you, you, got, got, it, you got it wrong. So I'll give you an example of one of the rhetorical tricks that Shakespeare is addicted to. Mm. Shakespeare will have learnt how to write, how to express himself at grammar school in Stratford-upon-Avon, mm -hmm. uh, where the Latin orators were taught, and many of his mm -hmm. rhetorical tricks were, were the tricks he was taught as part of a regular Elizabethan merchant son's uh, schooling. Yeah. But a specific example, one of the things that he uses a great deal is antithesis. He will construct a sentence, he will construct a speech around the idea that you can express something by balancing opposites. Sebastian, Sebastian's grieving for the sister he presumes to be drowned, dead. Uh, and through the entire scene, uh, his grief is emotionally the overwhelming factor. However, if all you play is grief, uh, all you'll get is tears. Now, he could just act grief. Many, particularly young actors, are trained to uh, identify the emotion and cry. My sister's dead, what would it be like? I'll cry. If you do just that, the scene will be incomprehensible. What you need to identify if you're playing Sebastian is that the way he expresses his grief is through certain rhetorical tricks which organize his passion, organize his thought. And if you can identify the patterns, you can make 
the language very clear. He describes his sister as, uh, to his uh, companion, Antonio, as a lady, sir, though it was said she much resembled me, was yet of many accounted beautiful. That's a very balanced sentence. Though it was said she much resembled me, was yet of many accounted beautiful. He could say she was beautiful. Now, what you have here is a typical Shakespearean rhetorical trick. This is a, a, a beautifully balanced antithesis. Though it was said she much resembled me, was yet of many accounted beautiful. And then he finishes it off. She is drowned already, sir, with salt water, though I seem to drown her remembrance again with more. Again, the use of the word though. She's drowned with salt water in the sea, though I seem to drown her remembrance again with more. A clue that at the end of the speech, he's starting to cry. Now, if what you're after is clarity, one of the first things you say is, you don't start to cry until the end of that speech, and probably you're trying to stop yourself crying. But technically, as an actor, what you have to do is start to feel the speech as a series of balanced antitheses to identify that this is the way that a lot of Shakespeare's characters speak and think. You'll find patterns like these underlie virtually every single speech that he writes. And if you can start to think and feel in this way, then it will be clear. How did you deal with uh, this question of an actor on the stage uh, performing for a full audience as opposed to a camera? What did you tell them to do differently? One thing that Shakespeare gives you is that these plays are written for platforms that are thrust out into the middle of a milling crowd. Uh, scenes, emotional, intense, difficult scenes between two people. They still require a certain projection, a certain size. One, one thing, I, one thing uh, I often do is start off rehearsing an intense personal scene uh, by asking the actors to be a, a great distance from each other. They have to therefore project their feelings to each other. And then if and when we choose to stage it intimately, uh, they still have a memory of that distance because, of course, the back row of the audience is uh, even further from them than they once were from each other. And why would an actress who's got a, a major career at this point uh, in film and television want to do a Shakespeare play? This seems to be the sort of history of, uh, of major actors, that they want to go to Shakespeare after they're successful. Catherine Hepburn spent a good part of her life doing Shakespeare. What do you think that they get out of it? It's very simple. They get out of it the best scripts that they'll ever work on in their lives. That good actors are excited by not just good parts and good plays, but good words. Uh, one of the actors said to me, Kira Sedgwick said to me, who's uh, who's been on stage before, but as the main part of her career has been uh, has been in movies, that she had always felt up until this point, that the scripts that she worked on were hampering her, were holding her back, were not, in, were not allowing her to express everything she wanted to express. And this was the first time she felt that, at all points, the script was supporting her and beckoning her forward. This is great. Thanks very much for this. I think uh, we're all going to enjoy the next act. Thank you very much. Live from Lincoln Center is made possible by a major grant from MetLife, the company that helps you make sense of it all, and on behalf of MetLife's affiliate, New England Financial. This program is also made possible by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, Thomas H. Lee and Ann Tenenbaum, the Irene Diamond Fund, the Lou Esther T. Mertz Charitable Trust, the Fan Fox and Leslie R. Samuels Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. You're watching PBS.